as I thought that, that most of you are probably here, am I right, that for a DUI charge or something like that? All right, so, and most of you probably have attorneys, and my advice would be if you don't have an attorney, you, you probably need to at least talk to somebody about it that knows what they're doing on, on DUI charges because they're so serious. But what we're looking at in this is I thought I would give you an idea of sort of how you got here. And it's not going to be specific to each one's individual case, but I wanted to talk about the three phases of a DUI encounter that generally lead to an arrest. Everybody wants to focus on, uh, uh, Rhonda, are you ready for me? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Everybody wants to focus on the test results. And, you know, you blew a whatever, or your blood test was, was a 09 or, 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 or an 010 or whatever it is. But what you're looking at in this is you have to get to the actual arrest before you ever have to worry about the test results. So there's three phases of a DUI encounter before you ever get to where they want you to participate in any state approved test. Now, most of you have probably dealt with the entire size of 5,000. That's the majority of the breath test that's out there, or the test. Sometimes they ask for blood tests. And sometimes you have a refusal where the person says, I'm not going to take the state administered test. But what we want to talk about, though, is how you get to that point, how you get to being arrested, and then you have to deal with the test. So the first phase out of the three phases that law enforcement has and what they're taught. Now, you need to understand that law enforcement goes to school. They go through classes. And the classes that they're taught just on the third phase. Now, the first phase is your driving their observation of you driving your vehicle and whatever reason they had for stopping you in the first place. Second phase is the personal interaction that they have with you whenever they come up and say, can I see your license, your driver's your insurance, you've been drinking tonight, and everything that follows from that. The third phase is field sobriety testing. Now field sobriety testing, and I can promise you our, my talk today won't be nearly as long as, as what it takes to train these officers. The field sobriety testing takes a, is a three-day course that they take on the actual field sobriety test. We're not going to get into a three-day course on field sobriety testing, but they go through this testing and they're taught by instructors the exact procedures that they're supposed to use in order to use the field sobriety test effectively. A lot of times they don't do that. Let's talk about uh, phase one, though, your driving. There are uh, 24 cues that they look for. And, and it, it's actually cues and not clues, but everybody thinks of it as a clue that they're looking for. But there's 24 clues whenever they're observing your driving that they're trained to look for. Uh, anybody have any idea what some of those are? I can throw some. Seat belt. Yours are seat belt? Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's actually not one of the things that they're trained to look for, but as far as a DUI driver. Well, swerving. Okay. Swerving. <coughs> Weaving. Fair, Weaving. Fair to maintain lane. Fair to maintain lane. The, uh, some of the other ones are something as, as obscure as appearing to be impaired. Uh, I talked with an officer out of Atlanta that was, I uh, did most of his work up on 400 in Atlanta, and he said he pulled up at a stoplight one day, looked over, and said there was a driver over there with a hands on the wheel, cigarette in his mouth that had burned all the way up to the filter. Light turned green, driver just sat there. Ash just hanging on that cigarette, and the <laughs> cigarette just hanging on his lip. That was his reason for stopping him, because he appeared to be impaired. So this driver, who didn't do anything necessarily wrong, but that's what he was stopped for. That's how he got it wound up getting the DUI. You've got other things like turning with a wide radius. Now, that was the number one reason in the Atlanta area for stopping people at one period of time. And you have to understand, turning with a wide radius is up to the judgment of the officer. Uh, it, it's kind of like weaving. It's up to the judgment of the officer. A majority of times when I see videos of, of people who's been stopped for DUI, uh, the driving is not that bad. You don't notice anything that I probably wouldn't do on my way to work anymore. Uh, you don't notice anything that, that normal drivers do, but in the state of Georgia, you're required to drive arrow straight down the road. If you don't maintain an equal distance from the center lane to the white fog line, you have weed within your own lane, basically, and they can pull you over. Now, turning abruptly or illegally. Now, that's something that, that comes up a lot of times in roadblock cases because people will see a roadblock and they'll just 
turn off on the first street they see. Well, if they don't use their blinker, uh, that's an illegal turn. They can go pull you over and stop you. All right? now, it, you might find this a little unusual, but in Georgia, it's not illegal to see a roadblock and say, I don't really want to go through it. I don't have time for it. I'm going to turn my blinker on. I'm going to slow down. I'm going to wait for oncoming traffic to pass, and I'm going to turn and go down this road. That's not illegal. However, if law enforcement sees you do that, most of the time they're going to run you down and, and stop you. But it's still not anything that you can't use to defend yourself when you come to court if you know what you're doing and you've got somebody that's willing to defend you. Another thing that I've seen recently is headlights. People either don't turn them on when they're supposed to or they're fumbling with the controls and they turn them off and then flip them back on again. Well, you know, that's might as well wave a red flag at a state patrolman because he's going to stop you. Uh, now, after, after these 24 cues that they're looking for, and, and like I say, there's, there's tons of them, can you, can you think of something that most people would consider uh, a cue that they would look for? A lot of people get stopped for speeding. <clears throat> Do you think that's a cue that they're, that they're supposed to look for? Speeding is not. Speeding is not a cue. When you think about it, if you're stopped for speeding and nothing else, no weaving, no reckless driving, no fair to maintain, uh, if you're stopped only for speeding, it takes more coordination to drive faster than the speed limit, all right, safely, because you didn't receive any other violation, safely than it does to drive the actual speed limit. So your coordination has to be better. Your eye hand coordination is better. Your depth perception is better. All of your reactions have to be faster to do that. So speeding is not an indicator. An indicator that has to do with speed, though, is if you're driving more than 10 miles an hour under the speed limit. All right, if you're just creeping along saying, I'm just going to get home, that's what they look for. Especially up in Atlanta, when you've got all the ones up there that are specially trained and they go out and, and do all the DUI interception, basically. What they're looking for, say, on Georgia 400 coming out of Buckhead and, and Atlanta up there around Lennox, what they're looking for is a fellow on Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night that's running, instead of running 70, he's running 50. Just going to just gonna get home. That's what they're looking for. Somebody that's under the speed limit. Now, after they turn on the blue lights, and, and their question is, do I want to stop this person? That's what they're looking for. Can I find a violation to stop this person for? <coughs> now, when I talk about when I talk about bad driving, and that's sort of what they're looking for, and everybody thinks they're looking for the classic driver, like, like the commercials you see on TV now, uh, where the folks are just weaving all over the road and just sloshing the liquor, the wine, or whatever, back and to in the car. That's what everybody thinks a, a classic DUI case is. And it probably would be, but that's not what I see on videos. Very seldom do I see actual people weaving over the lines. So after they've decided, hey, I'm going to stop this person, let's say they say he's weaving, all right? Once they turn on the blue lights, there's six more cues that they look for, all right? So they've turned the blue lights on. One of them is an attempt to flee, of course. You know, well, we're gonna, I'm going to outrun the law. Well, it's hard to outrun a radio. But uh, that's one of the cues. Another one is you just ignore the blue lights. I mean, they're behind you with the wigwags going, and I've seen some of the local sheriff's department's cars have got more blue lights than I've ever seen. I mean, in the mirrors and everywhere. I mean, just all the lights you can imagine. Uh, but if you don't respond to that, they're going to note all this down on their reports. Now, uh, especially if you get up, uh, they get up behind you, turn on the blue lights, and you're just swerving all over the road, scared to death. Actually, you know, you can turn that around and say anybody would do that whenever they're driving down the road and the blue lights all of a sudden just go to blaze them out or they're going to be looking, they might weed. But it can be explained, but they're going to note it in their reports. Now, when you pull over and stop, it's a little different story. Now, if you're just pull over and stop, come to a normal stop on the side of the road, it's really not a problem. You're really not exhibiting any cues that they're looking for. However, if you run into the ditch and you just down, you know, front of your car, down in the ditch, back ends up. That could be a bad little indicator. All right, but that's what sort of the things that they're looking for after they turn on the blue lights. And now the officers are trained that out of these three phases that we're talking about, each phase is weighted equally. Phase one is just as important as phase two. 
Your driving is just as important as what you say and how you act when they talk to you, and that's just as important as a field sobriety test. Now, after their test of should I stop the vehicle, they turn on the blue lights, they've stopped you <clears throat> for whatever reason. You, you need to think about think about a couple of different little scenarios. And, and one of the, the people here has mentioned pulled over for a seatbelt violation. That's not bad driving. When you think about it, you've been stopped for drunken driving. All right, that's what you're stopped for, drunken driving. Well, if you're stopped for a seatbelt violation, that's, that's not an indicator of drunken driving. They haven't seen any bad driving. Okay. Another thing is you pull up to a roadblock. You pull up to the roadblock, you don't run over the officer. He doesn't have to jump out of your way. You don't run off the road, run into the back of another car. You don't do anything wrong. You pull up to the roadblock, license and insurance, you hand it to him. Have you been drinking? When you say, yes, I have, or I had one earlier, that starts your, your encounter, but you charged with drunken driving with no bad driving. Okay? So that, this first phase is a little more important than people think about because a lot of these things can be explained and a lot of the reasons that they pull people over doesn't necessarily indicate that you're under the influence of anything, okay? Now, phase two is the personal contact that the officer has with you. The test that he's asking himself is, should I ask this person to step out of the vehicle so we can continue this conversation? If, you, if he pulls you over and says, ma'am, I noticed you were weaving. Sir, I noticed you didn't have your seatbelt on. Can see license and, and your insurance, registration. He checks all that out. You know, everything all right with you. Have a nice day. I mean, that's, that's no problem. What, what he's asking himself for is what reason do I have to ask this person to step out the car? Well, some of the things they're looking for are bloodshot eyes. All right? That's one of the main things that I see on reports, is blood, a person had bloodshot eyes. And we'll, we'll come back to that. The kicker is an open container. If you've got an open container in the vehicle, you're going to be getting out of the vehicle. You're going to be getting out and talking to them some more. All right? Another one is, uh, well, let's see. They're going to ask you for your license and your insurance if you don't give it to them, or you hand them your credit card. That's going to be an indicator. They're going to be looking for that. All right, they're going to be looking for your ability to get your license and get your insurance card out or your registration out and hand it to them. If you're fumbling with it, dropping it on the floor, can't get it out, hand them your credit card, you've got trouble. Okay? That's some of the indicators that they look for. Uh, what you need to understand is that they're going to note everything that you do. A well-trained officer will note everything that you do in his report or, or, he will mention it on the video. He'll say things like, can I see your license and your insurance? And he'll stand there and say, I, I notice you're having trouble getting them out of your wallet. Do you need some help? You know, this kind of thing. Do you need help finding it? No, ma'am, I don't need your credit card. You know, no, ma'am, I don't need your Sears card. No, ma'am, I don't need video warehouse card. That's what they'll do. They'll note it on that video. All right? So anytime you have an issue like that, it wouldn't be a bad idea to say, no, my wallet's so full of, of cards, I've got to you know, use a little extra help to get it out. You, you need to explain, if they're going to mention something about what you've done, you need to explain why you've done it. All right? The next thing is, these are basic, those are basically sight cues that they look for. There's 12 of those. Hearing cues, there's five that they look for. One is slurred speech. All right? Well, I've represented people before that had speech impediments. And they naturally had impaired, not impaired speech, but altered speech. So when you get to court, the officer testifies, well, he had you know, slurred speech. And my client then gets up and testifies, and his speech is natural for him with a speech impediment. The officer's never spoken to him before, has no idea how he speaks in the first place. It goes the same way if you get over in a little south of here, over near the military base, some of those law enforcement officers are all maybe from Wisconsin or Washington State or Illinois. They don't talk like we do in the South. They may claim that somebody with slow speech is slurred speech to them, but that's just an indicator that they look for. Uh, unusual statements is another thing that they'll look for. They'll look for, let's say, uh, where are you headed tonight? Well, I'm going to the moon. 
you know, if you answer something crazy like that, they're going to make sure they note it and say, what? Where did you say you were going? So to make sure that the video is going to have all this on it. Now, when I talk about the videos, y'all need to understand that. Let's say I'm, I'm in the police car, all right, and the video shines. It's looking out here. It's looking at the, at the classroom. But normally, I'd say 90% of the time, what I see on the video doesn't get my client in trouble, and it doesn't get them out of trouble. All right? What I hear on the video does. What the officer says, what my client says, is what either gets them in trouble or gets them out of trouble. Normally. Normally. Now, that officer has a microphone on him. It's either down on his, on his belt line, or he's got a microphone up here. He's got a microphone on if they've got video cameras. Also, there's a microphone in the car. The new trooper cars, the chargers, a lot of them have the DVD systems. That recorder or, or, or system inside the car, especially in the back seat where you'll, you'll be, is so good that I've heard both sides of cell phone conversations. The person will call the parent and say, hey, I've been pulled over. Can you come get my car? You know, I've been charged DUI, and they'll go to the parent will go to say, well, what in the world have you done? And, I only had six or seven beer, and, and all this is on the video. So, it, you know, you got to be careful of what you say when you're dealing with law enforcement. Now, the main thing that they're looking for is admission of drinking. You know, ma'am, you've been drinking, and I smell something. I smell alcohol. You've been drinking. The first thing about that is when I go to court, officers will have to admit that they've been trained that they don't smell alcohol. People think they smell alcohol, but they really they don't. Alcohol is odorless. It has no smell. You don't smell pure grain alcohol. What you smell is what it's made from or what it's flavored with. You smell an odor of an alcoholic beverage. Uh, an example is if, if where I'm standing, if I drank a beer, and, and where y'all are right here at this first table, if I drank a beer, my wife knows I drank a beer. She can smell it. If I drink a vodka tonic, she can't smell it. Vodka is stronger than beer by volume, but it doesn't have a smell. It's all what's, what you're smelling with beer. You're smelling the, the barley, the hops. That's what you're smelling. You're not smelling alcohol. Okay. But if you admit that, well, I had a couple drinks earlier or just a few, a couple hours ago, or you know, the, main, the, the main one you hear is had a couple of beer. Well, what you're looking at then is you can guarantee that you're going to get out of the car and you're going to get into field sobriety testing. Okay? You'll move from phase two to phase three if you admit that you've been drinking. Now, I'm not telling you not to tell the truth, but a lot of times I'll see people that may have just left the party, had a beer, put it down, got in the vehicle, left, got pulled over within a minute of leaving the party, imagine that, and the officer will ask them, I smell alcohol, alcoholic beverage, you've been drinking. Yeah, yeah, I had a, I had a couple more, I had one. Uh, how long ago was it? Oh, a couple hours ago. People think that if you say it was longer, it's been a while since I've had this drink, it'll be better. What you're going to run into is you're going to run into phase three, with field sobriety mm -hmm. testing. You're going to run into an alcohol sensor, which doesn't have a slope detector. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But if you have just had something in your mouth called residual mouth alcohol and you blow in the alcohol sensor, you're going to blow high. You're going to blow high, high. Right, you might only have had one beer. Be less than a .02. All right, just virtually no alcohol in your system. However, if, when you blow in that alpha sensor, it doesn't have anything to differentiate between alcohol that's in your mouth that you just had in your mouth from that beer and alcohol that's deep lung air. So you might blow a .14. Okay? Just the officer's going to say, oh, that's good enough. Get in the car. Because you said you didn't have anything to drink hours ago when you just did. So that's that's not a good strategy uh, to think that law enforcement is going to get cut you any slack if you tell them well, I had something to drink hours ago. Now, the next thing that you're looking for, also, well also, I, I can tell you that the officer will have to admit in court that his training, he's been taught that the odor of alcoholic beverage has no direct correlation to blood alcohol content or impairment. Okay? Now, Think about it this way, um, let's say uh, you go golfing and you have a hole in one and your buddies just shower you down with beer. You just poured it all over you. You're going to reek like beer, all right? You get in your car, you're going home, you had not drank a thing. 
Nothing. All right? But you reek. You smell like you've been on a two-week drunk, as they'd say. But you have no alcohol in your system. All right? Odor of alcohol has no direct correlation with blood alcohol content or impairment. And he's going to have to admit that uh, pursuant to his training. A well-trained officer, let's put it that way. Now, once you exit from your vehicle, they're going to say, how about step out for me? i got some questions for you, or would you mind doing some tests? Once you step out of the vehicle, they're going to be noting your reactions. Everything that you do, from your driving to everything you tell them, and now it's everything that you physically do when you get out of the car. They're looking for seven cues. Now, there's 28 cues that they look for total in their personal contact with you. But the seven cues is if you get out angry, they're going to note in there that you know he was an angry drunk. When he got out of the vehicle, he was, he was upset, he was angry. You know, that's what they're going to note. Or they'll be saying things like that on the video. Or if you get out cussing, think about, it's kind of like you, you, you tell your children. I've got a 17-year-old, and I tell the 17-year-old, don't do or say anything that you don't want your mama, me, your preacher, your grandparents to know. Right. If you get out cussing at the officer, that's not going to look good if you go to a trial. So you just got to, you got to think about what you're doing. Uh, one thing that I've seen a couple of is leaving the car in gear. So when they ask you to step out of the car, the car's still running, you open the door, go to get out, the car starts rolling. Up. That's not a good thing to have happen. Uh, the officer can describe how you exit the vehicle as climbing out of the vehicle. All right. So if you open the door and then you reach over and grab onto the window and you have to pull yourself out of the vehicle, they're going to note it as climbing out of the vehicle. Uh, another thing that they love to use is leaning against the car. You know, he was drinking, he was unsteady on his feet, and he had to lean against the car for support. So if you walk down the car and, and you put your hand on it and stand there, they're going to note it. Now me, I've got back problems. and uh, So when I get out of a vehicle, it takes me a minute to stand up, get straight, and start walking. So they might say, I was unsteady on my feet, or I climbed out of the vehicle. But if they make a note of that, first thing I'm going to say is, you know, I've got back problems, and it takes me a minute to get going. So you want to explain anything that you can think, or anything that they note uh, in the video, you want to explain the reason that you're doing it. Now, once they look at personal contact, and they decided, well, really, quite frankly, if you say, I've been drinking earlier, you're going to phase three. Uh, now phase three is standardized field sobriety testing. The standardized field sobriety testing, does everybody know how many field sobriety tests they are that are standardized in the state of Georgia? Do you know what they are? Do you know the correct order that they're supposed to give them in? First field sobriety test they're supposed to give is horizontal gaze and stagnus, where they tell you to stand with your feet together, your hand by your side, touch your head back. Follow the finger, the pen, the, the stimulus with your eyes and your eyes only. Don't move your head. All right. The next test that they're supposed to give and in the correct order is the walk and turn test. That's the nine steps out. Pivot on your front foot with a series of small steps. Walk nine <coughs> steps back, your hands down by your side. Looking at your feet and counting your steps when you go. Touch it heel to toe. Okay? That's the second test they're supposed to give. The third test they're supposed to give, and in this order, is the one leg stand. Everybody knows that when you stand there and hold your foot out. You count by one thousands. All right? And the last thing they're going to do is the alcohol sensor. That's where they have you blow in the field testing device. Okay? That's the last test they're supposed to give. They're supposed to give that test to confirm the results that they have on three previous tests, HGM, walk and turn, and one leg stand. Okay? Because wouldn't they look a little foolish if they <coughs> gave you these tests, claim that you failed, take you to the jail, say that it's alcohol, you blow, and you blow nothing. No alcohol in your system. Wouldn't that be a little funny, a little embarrassing uh, to the officer? So they use that alcohol sensor to confirm that it's uh, actually alcohol that's in your system. Now, the HGN test, 